Good evening, and I would like to thank your bishop and all of you for welcoming me to your beautiful country and your beautiful city. I was once in charge of a college seminary. I was the principal superior and disciplinarian for 55 men ages 18 to 22. Do you know what it is like to live with 55 young men ages 18 to 22? Well, I never got to bed before 1 a.m. Pizza night for 55 men was 55 pizzas. Now, one winter morning, I can remember very clearly, it had frozen during the night, the, the ground was very icy, and a seminarian was on his way to class as I was. We were passing each other on the campus. He was going one way, I was going another. I said good morning, he passed by me. Now, it was very slippery out, and this seminarian was not taking too much care as to where he was going. Now, I was very busy that day. I had much to do that would keep me busy all day into the night. And yet the Lord was going to ask something very special of me that day. He was going to ask me to say yes to the cross. As the seminarian passed by me, I was on my way to class, I heard a terrible noise. And this was the noise of someone slipping. Whoops! I heard a crash. I turned over and saw this seminarian. He had slipped on the ice. Really his own fault. He was going much too fast on this ice. I looked down at him and I saw that his foot was in the exact opposite direction where it should be on a human leg. He had completely twisted his ankle around and he was in agony. Now, it was my responsibility to see that he was cared for. Now, I had much to do that day, and yet the Lord was asking something of me. Would I say yes to the cross that morning? Would I say yes to the outpouring of grace flowing from the crucified Christ? Well, stay tuned, and I will let you know. I'd like to take you now to a city that your bishop knows well, and our ambassador Nicholson knows very well also. That is the city of Rome. If you have ever been to Rome or seen images of it, you know that one of its most spectacular characteristics are the many fountains of Rome. There are many, many beautiful fountains in Rome, ranging from all different sizes. There is a very large uh, fountain in the Piazza Novona, a 30-foot high statue of Neptune in a very large fountain. Most tourists are familiar with the famous Trevi Fountain or the fountains in St. Peter's Square. All the way down to very little tiny fountains, you can find little cherub heads on the side of a wall spewing a single stream of water. But there are fountains everywhere in Rome, and they flow perpetually. The fountains in Rome flow 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they are everywhere in the eternal city. Now, what most people do not realize is that there is not a single fountain in the city of Rome that is mechanically powered. The Romans, the ingenious Romans, many, many centuries ago, built aqueducts that carried the vast reservoir of fresh water from the mountains down into the city of Rome. And these aqueducts were constructed in such a way that the force of gravity alone brings the water down into the city and gushes into these fountains perpetually. While I was doing my studies in Rome and looking at these fountains, it occurred to me that the rushing of water into the city of Rome through these fountains is a symbol 
of every grace that you and I receive. For just as the source of fresh water for the eternal city is the mountain, so every grace you and I receive, the source of this grace, remains the inner life of the Trinity, the mountain where God alone dwells. And just as the pure water rushes down from the mountain into the city of Rome, so every grace you and I receive comes, flows down to us from the temple of heaven in the incarnation. And just as the water gushes forth in the fountain, so every grace that you and I receive gushes forth from the sacred wounds of the crucified Christ. Jesus is the fountain of all holiness. And his hands, his feet, and his side are the portals through which we receive the gushing and purifying waters of salvation. Our bishop read the second Eucharistic prayer this evening at Mass, and right at the beginning, you will recall, it says, it calls Jesus the fountain of all holiness. We receive graces from his wounds. Now, in order to explain to you how Jesus is the fountain of all holiness, I want to take you back for a moment to the very first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis. Do you know that the very first living thing mentioned in Genesis are trees. God brought forth every kind of seed-bearing tree, Genesis says. And yet in that special garden that God created for the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, there were two trees different from all the other trees. A lot of us from the story only remember one tree that was different. There were actually two. The first special tree was called the tree of life. And it was placed in the exact center of the Garden of Eden. The function of the tree of life was to give everlasting life to those who ate from it. Its fruit bestowed immortality. So as long as Adam and Eve kept eating from the fruit of the tree of life every day, they would never die. Such was God's plan in the beginning for man and woman to live in harmony with him in the garden forever. Now the second tree that was different in the garden, the tree we're more familiar with, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was the only tree, of course, from which they were forbidden to eat. Can you see right in the beginning how God sets up what is good for man and what is bad for man? It's today what we call the natural law. We don't decide what the natural law is the law upon which all civil law must be based. God decides what the natural law is, and it's eternal. It does not change. This is good for man. This is bad for man. It is good for man to eat of the tree of life. It is bad for man to eat of the tree of his own choosing. Now Eve walks by this tree, this other tree one day, and who, of course, is coiled around that, serp that uh, tree? Satan, in the image of a serpent. And he says, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, he says to Eve, Hey Eve, uh, why don't you eat the fruit of this tree? Eve says, well, we're not supposed to eat from this tree. This is what God has decided, what is good for us. Satan says, oh, forget that. Doesn't the fruit of this tree look just as good as the other tree? Why don't you have some of it? In fact, he tells Eve, if you eat of this tree, you will become God's knowing, deciding what is good and evil. Do you know, by the way, Satan said something there that was partially true, to trick Eve. See, that's what Satan does. If Satan were to speak outright 100% heresy to you, you'd reject it. But Satan doesn't do that. What C.S. Lewis, which our bishop mentioned in, the, in his homily, what C.S. Lewis mentions to us is Satan speaks a partial truth because he wants us to like him. He wants us to like his ways. So he tells Eve something true and tricks her into thinking it'll be something good for her. Yes, if Eve eats of this other tree, she will decide that day she will be God. 
deciding what is good for her. Instead of letting God decide, I will decide. Isn't that what all sin is in its core? I decide I'm going to be God today. I, God's decided this is not good for me. I'm going to decide today, yes it is. And of course, this is what Eve does, and this is what Adam does. And what was their punishment? It wasn't simply banishment from the garden. It was banishment from the presence of the tree of life that tree that gave them everlasting life. They could not reach out to it anymore. And because they could not reach out to eat its fruit, Adam and Eve and all of their descendants were destined to die. Now God promised through the prophets, however, that this would not last forever. That God would bring the tree of life back one day. One day the tree of life that once grew in the Garden of Eden in the center would reappear somewhere on the earth and give man another opportunity to reach out his hand to it. Read chapter 47 of the prophet Ezekiel and especially he gives us a vision of when the tree of life would return. The prophet Ezekiel had a vision of the city of Jerusalem when the Messiah would arrive. And Ezekiel tells us, I looked up into the sky, and what did I see? I see the temple, the, the city of Jerusalem, beautifully restored when the Messiah arrives. And in the center of the city, I see the temple, the beautiful golden temple of Solomon. And Ezekiel tells us, I see something flowing from the eastern side, the right side of the temple, flowing out from the right side of the temple beneath its threshold. What does he see? He sees a stream of water, a living stream of water, starting off only as a trickle, but then growing and growing into an overwhelming torrent, a river of life flowing from the right side of the temple. And when this water, this this stream of living water is flowing. Ezekiel says, I see something growing in the ground. Growing in the ground, once the water of life rushes over the ground, I see the tree of life. It is growing again. And so Ezekiel told us that when the Messiah would arrive, the temple would be restored, water would flow from its right side, and the tree of life would blossom once again. The tree of life that grew in the garden has come back again for our salvation. When did the tree of life reappear again for us? Well, St. Peter in two places and St. Paul in two places both use this phrase. They say, Jesus bore our sins by hanging upon the tree. They didn't use that word mistakenly. Under inspiration from the Holy Spirit, both Saints Peter and Paul used that word to communicate this truth to us. The cross is the tree of life that has come back again, that is growing, that is blossoming on the earth. You see, Ezekiel's vision in chapter 47 was a prefigurement of Good Friday. The tree of life once grew in the Garden of Eden, now it grew on Mount Calvary. Adam and Eve could no longer reach out their hand to the first tree of life. It was Jesus himself, the new Adam, who reached out his hand to the perfect tree of life. And the temple is restored. About a week before the Lord's Passion, he has the Sadducees very upset, and he tells them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will make it rise again. And the Gospel writer, St. John, tells us he is referring to his body. Jesus' body is the perfect temple. In fact, friends, the first temple, Solomon's temple, was built just as a prefigurement of Jesus himself, his body. He is the perfect temple. And while the Lord is hanging upon the cross, the perfect temple, reconciling the world, the world to himself upon the perfect tree of life, the soldier pierces his side, and what flows out? Water, a stream of living water, 
flows out from his right side. These, friends, are the waters of grace. Every grace that you and I receive flows forth from the sacred wounds of Christ. His hands, his feet, his side, his head, his back, his whole body torn open. His sacred wounds are the portals through which you and I receive the gushing and purifying waters of salvation. This is how he is the fountain of all holiness. He is hanging upon the tree of life, and the stream of living water is flowing out for us. Friends, I once saw a documentary on the Shroud of Turin, that shroud which is more than likely the, the burial shroud of our Lord. I listened to an interview by a scientist who is an expert in Roman history and Roman military weaponry. He started his study not as a believer, but he ended up after his study being baptized, a Catholic. He looked at the shroud and said, I can tell from the wounds on this man's body, he said he could not believe the ferocity of the Roman soldiers in what they did to this man in the shroud. He could tell by the wounds the type of weaponry, the cruel weaponry the soldiers used. They know, he knew that they scourged the Lord many, many, many more times than was normally prescribed for an offense. And this scientist said something to me that I meditate upon every Lent. He said that this man in the shroud, his body was so torn open that his body was one open wound. There is very little blood in the Shroud of Turin. Scientists wondered why. He said it makes perfect sense. By the time they wrapped this man's body in the shroud, he would have poured out almost every drop of his blood. And this scientist then said this. I never forgot it. He said what this man looked like upon the cross, he said looks, he looked far worse than any image you have ever seen of the crucifixion. Any image in a in a painting or a mosaic or an actual crucifix, he said, does not compare to describe, doesn't begin to describe what he looked like. He said his own mother would have had difficulty recognizing him. You, kn you know who stood at the foot of the cross. His own mother would have had difficulty recognizing him. What did Isaiah tell us? So marred was he, so beyond that we did not even recognize him as a man, the King of Kings. This is what the Lord did so that you and I could receive these waters of salvation pouring forth from the perfect tree of life. Now, friends, our bishop just beautifully celebrated the Mass for us here at this altar. Do you know that every time the bishop or a priest begins the Mass, something very wonderful happens. The tree of life that once grew in the Garden of Eden, that most perfectly grew on Mount Calvary, that same tree of life comes back to us and grows again here for us in the Holy Eucharist. When we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, we are not just remembering what Jesus did. The power of his sacrifice on the cross, the perfect tree of life, comes back to us, truly becomes present for us on this altar. The tree of life comes back for us, giving us an opportunity to reach out to receive the food of everlasting life. Remember the tree of life in the Garden of Eden? It gave immortal fruit, the fruit of everlasting life, the fruit that we rejected? What is the fruit of the perfect tree of life, the tree of life which is the cross? It is his body and blood. That is the food of everlasting life. What does Jesus tell us in John chapter 6? For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. 
The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has everlasting life. I sometimes like to think about when we come forward to receive our Lord in the most blessed sacrament. Mystically now, it's like you're coming forward in the Garden of Eden to the Tree of Life. It is also as if you're coming forward to Mount Calvary to the foot of the cross. You are coming forward to receive the Lord's body and blood made truly present for us. You see, his sacrifice was once and for all. His sacrifice happened once in time, and yet it transcends all time. It reaches back to the beginning of time, and it reaches forward to the parousia. That's why when you and I celebrate the Holy Eucharist, we come forward to the altar, we have stepped outside of time. You know, I sometimes give talks to priests. A while ago I gave a talk to the uh, priests of the Archdiocese of Denver, Colorado. Next month I go to the priests of, uh, of Worcester, Massachusetts, and there's some others I can't remember. Whenever I talk to priests, I try to teach them about the beauty of their vocation. Because when the tree of life grows again for us, the priest is standing there right at the center. It is in his hands that the tree of life grows again, that Jesus' body and blood becomes present for the rest of us hungry souls to receive. If you're here tomorrow, I'm going to speak about the beauty and holiness of the Mass. Friends, let me tell you about a priest that I know that I think will help us understand how the waters of grace reach down through time and history from the cross to touch us at this very moment. He's a priest my age. I've known him for many years. I've been in the Dominican order over well, 21 years now, and I've known him even before that. Wonderful priest. Now, some years ago, there was a tragedy in his family. I don't have to go into what it was, but it's one of these tragedies that hits families. Now, because of this tragedy in his family, this priest started to doubt some of the truths of the faith. And this, this happens, of course, to, it can happen to anyone. He told me it started off with some small doubts, but then got to be bigger and bigger over the months. He told me that it got so bad for him that he can remember being at the Mass during the consecration, holding Jesus in his hands at the moment of consecration, and he told me he began to doubt whether Jesus was there at all. This priest was in darkness. Now, you never know it by his homilies. His homilies were still wonderful. Now, he knew that he had a mission to preach the truths of the faith to the people, and, and he fulfilled that. Only I knew about his inner darkness. And this priest went to the Lord and said, Lord, if you are asking me to carry this cross because of what has happened in my family, this darkness I'm in, I will do it. I will do it until you give me the grace to be healed. But I will be faithful to my vocation as a priest even during this darkness. You see, the Lord was drawing a deeper and deeper gift of faith out of this priest. The priest's darkness lasted for two and a half years until one day. He was driving across country and needed a bit of a break, driving through New York City. And so he decided to stop at one of our Dominican monasteries of nuns. We Dominicans have monasteries of cloistered nuns. I'm the chaplain at one of them. Uh, beautiful, beautiful monastery and beautiful sisters in uh, West Springfield, Massachusetts. The nuns there perpetually adore Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. In the monastery where I serve, the nuns adore Jesus in a monstrance that is held by six golden angels holding the monstrance for the sisters and the people to come and gaze upon him. Well, this priest stopped by our monastery in the Bronx, it just so happened to be September the 29th, the Feast of the Archangels. He walked in just for a little break from driving. He certainly expected nothing uh, incredible to happen. He went into the chapel, 
And this is a cloistered monastery chapel. So the nuns are on one side. There's a large grill work. And the people and the priests were on the other side. The monstrance in this monastery is right at the top of this grill work, very high up, about 30 feet high, shining down on the nuns on one side and the priest and the people on the other side. And so this priest just walked in in the middle of the day, expecting nothing to happen at all, sat down, and he told me he looked up at the monstrance. He simply looked up, and he told me that as he looked up, when his eyes first caught the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, the second his eyes reached the host, he told me, all of the darkness, all of the blackness in his mind and heart, it was all banished in a second, he said, and everything was light again. He told me he began to believe in all the truths of our Catholic faith and in his vocation as a priest all at once in one second. Now, he said, this was not an emotional experience at all, he said. He said, the best way I can describe it is in one second, everything was darkness, and in the next second, everything was light. Do you know this priest has never had another doubt about a truth of the faith? Can you see what happened to this priest that September the 29th? The Lord's presence in the Blessed Sacrament, the power of his sacrifice on the cross, the tree of life, truly present in that monstrance. You see, the Lord's sacrifice on Good Friday is eternal, goes back to the beginning and to the end of time. The graces flowing from the crucified Christ as his precious blood was falling and watering the earth, the Lord reconciling the world to himself, restoring it in God's image. That precious blood traveled down through time and history, through the Holy Eucharist, down from that monstrance, and just swooped down, passed right through that priest in order to heal him to save his vocation, to save his life, really, to tell you the truth. I reminded this priest what a special gift he had been given. I told him that St. Teresa of Avila calls it an intellectual illumination. That is, the mind is completely illumined with all the truths of the faith all at once. And St. Teresa of Avila said, that is the greatest grace a human being can receive this side of heaven. It's an even greater grace than being given the gift to see a vision of the Blessed Mother. That's what this priest received that day. And he told me he thanks God every day at the Mass for receiving that wonderful gift. Friends, I like telling this story to people who think adoration of the Blessed Sacrament maybe is, is something passe or you know something old-fashioned we don't do anymore, say. Here is a priest whose life was saved just by looking at the host, just by gazing upon his holy face. Do you know this priest really, now in his life, he sings Psalm 40. Psalm 40, which says this, I waited, I waited for the Lord, and he stooped down to me. He heard my cry. He drew me out of the pit of despair, and he put a new song into my mouth. Friends, our bishop mentioned during his homily that the Lord does not ask us to endure anything that he himself did not endure. That is, whenever you and I are asked to accept the cross, whenever according to the Lord's plan of salvation for us, when he asks us to accept the cross, we need to say yes to him, to accept the cross. And the most wonderful graces are made manifest in our life, graces that we could not even begin to imagine. Because this priest, this friend of mine, said yes to the cross, the Lord revealed his most wonderful graces to him. Now, the Lord's timetable is not our timetable. The Lord heals us in his time, according to his design. I waited, I waited for the Lord, and he stooped down to me. 
Let me tell you about a physician that I know who waited for the Lord and for healing from the cross. Each year we Dominicans take handicapped people over to Lourdes in France, the place where Our Lady appeared to St. Bernadette in 1848. Many people are healed there. My, when it was my turn to go over, we brought a whole plane load of handicapped people over. On the trip was a physician who brought his eight-year-old daughter with him. Now, this physician, before his daughter was born, was one of these parents that had everything lined up what he was going to do with the child. The school she would attend, the sports she would play, he had everything planned. When his daughter was born, she was born with severe mental handicaps. She was not able to do any of the things that he had planned. And so this physician became despondent. He felt the Lord had abandoned him, and because of this, he was not perhaps the best father he could have been. He left the difficult work of raising a, a severely handicapped child to his wife. She took on most of the work. And so when his daughter turned eight years old, he took her to Lourdes and to ask Our Lady's intercession that she would intercede that the Lord would heal his daughter of her mental handicaps so she could do all the things that he had planned. Well, he brought her to the baths. If you've been to Lourdes, you know that there's a line for men and a line for women. I went, the line for men, you have to wait about five minutes. The line for women is about a mile long. Many, many more women go than men. And so we waited in line. We lowered her into the bath. She came out again. She looked just the same, as far as our eyes could tell. And even more, the physician became despondent. And so he went to the grotto at night, around midnight, at that time, all of the lights are shut off, just the candles are lit, but there are thousands of candles. They illumine the grotto, the cave, where Our Lady appeared to St. Bernadette. There's a statue of Our Lady there in the place where she appeared. And the physician told me, he sat by the river, a river of flowing water, by the way. He told me around midnight, he heard a voice, a voice of a woman. He said it was the most beautiful voice he had ever heard he believed it was the voice of the Blessed Mother. And the voice said this to him, I want you to love your daughter the way I do, just the way she is. The physician told me at that moment he was healed. At that moment he began to love his daughter fully, completely, as any father would love his daughter. You see, he went to Lourdes for one kind of healing, but he got another one instead. His daughter did not need to be healed. She was perfectly fine and a wonder of God's creation just as she was. He was the one who needed to be healed of his bitter and selfish heart. Do you know he came back from Lourdes a completely changed man? Now when you go over to his house, he will bring out his daughter and say, come and meet my daughter. Come and meet this precious jewel that the Lord gave me, my beautiful, my wonderful daughter. Say hello to her. Friends, whenever we suffer the cross, we go to the Lord and we say, Jesus, you know what I truly need to be healed from, and you know the time, the best time to be healed. When you say this to the Lord, he will not refuse your prayer. He will heal you according to the best healing he knows how to give and at the best time he knows how to give. All you need do is say yes to the waters of life. And so I was being asked to say yes when I saw the seminarian slip on the ice. Even though I was very busy, I could have easily asked someone else to do. Hey, you seminarian, come over here. Take care of him. He was being foolish. It's his own fault. Get him to the hospital. But it was my responsibility. I was the superior. I was 
they were put in my care. And so I went over to him. And I said, you've fallen down, haven't you? Well, he's in agony, by the way. We're going to have to take you to the hospital now. Well, we didn't need an ambulance. I just had to get him into my automobile, take him to the hospital. Now, the nearest hospital, it was not a Catholic hospital. I took him there. There were many people who slipped on the ice. So we had to wait. We waited about three hours before he got seen. He got x-rayed, etc. He had completely broken his ankle in three different places. He would need minor surgery. We got him admitted to the hospital, into his room. When I finally said goodbye to him, got him to his room, it was eight hours later. My whole day was ruined. Or so I thought. Three days later, it was time to pick the boy up at the hospital. Now, I could have sent someone else, but I drove him to the hospital. Okay, yes, it's my responsibility. I will go get him. I drove to the hospital. Now, remember, this is not a Catholic hospital. It's a rather small hospital. I drove there about 7 o'clock in the evening. I went into the lobby. There were two elevators going up to the patient's rooms. I pushed the button. And both elevator doors opened at the same time. One elevator door was empty. The other one had a little old lady with blue hair inside. She evidently had pushed the wrong button and her door just opened at the same time. Now came time for another decision. Which elevator door do I go into? Do I go into the empty one? Or do I go into the other one and risk being detained at an already busy day? You see, the graces flowing from the cross were flowing, coming down through time and history to touch me. Would I say yes? That's what the Lord is asking me. Father Peter, say yes. I went in the elevator with the little old lady. The door closed. She looked at me and said, You're a priest, right? Yes. You're a Dominican, right? Yes. Could you come and visit my husband? And inside, I went, oh. <laughs> now, I did not show that externally. But inside, I was, I knew this would happen. <laughs> I knew. <clears throat> oh. I said, ma'am, yes, I will. I always carry holy oils in the Blessed Sacrament if I'm going to any hospital. I said, ma'am, yes, but ma'am, I have to get this boy started out of the hospital. It takes time for the paperwork to be done. So I'm going to start his paperwork, and then I'm going to visit your husband. Where is he? Second floor. Okay, I'll come visit him. I got the boy's paperwork started, went down to the second floor. It's intensive care. I went over to the bay, and there were some 25 members of the man's family gathered around. He was dying. It was his last hours on earth. I went over to him. Now this man, for various reasons, had been away from the church for many, many years, decades. And here the Lord had arranged for a priest to be at his bedside. Remember, this wasn't a Catholic hospital. She would not have been able to call a priest somewhere and get a priest to come. It, it would not have happened. And yet here I was standing there. I did everything that a priest needs to do to reconcile a man, to bring him back into the church and to receive all the sacraments so that he could die in grace with all the members of his family around. Do you see how the Lord had arranged all of this? I needed to say yes to grace in order for this to happen, for the Lord to accomplish this wonderful miracle of grace. I could not have planned that if I tried. When I was a young priest, I was trying to plan many things, and an elderly Dominican came up to me and said, Father Peter, calm down. Jesus knows how to save the church better than you do. <laughs> he said, just say yes to grace, 
The Lord will take care of the rest. And he's right, he was right. He's since gone home to the Lord. Do you see, I had to say yes to going into that elevator with a little old lady, or none of this would have happened. That man would have died without the sacraments. I had to say yes that evening to go pick the boy up at the hospital, or it never would have happened. And do you realize I had to say yes three days before when he broke his ankle? Because if I had not brought him to the hospital that first day, I would not have gone back to go pick him up. I had to say yes to grace every step of the way so the Lord could accomplish a miracle. And who knows the effects of that miracle? There was a little boy standing there at the hospital. He was probably the man's grandson, maybe even great-grandson. And who knows, maybe 15, 20 years from now, that little boy will get the inspiration, the grace to be a priest, and he'll say, do you know, I remember when I was a little boy, there was a priest dressed in white standing at my grandfather's bedside. And so maybe I should be a priest too. We don't know. So many ripples of grace. All we need to do is say yes to them, friends. That's all we need to do. I tell people, I tell priests especially all the time, if you say yes to grace every day, your life will never be boring. Because there are miracles of grace blossoming all around you. All you have to do is say yes to grace. I need to say yes to grace as a priest. You need to say yes to grace as a mother, as a father, as a sister. But whenever you say yes to grace each day, miracles abound. And so when the day comes that the Lord asks you to say yes to the cross, to accept the cross, you should joyfully embrace it and say, yes, Lord. I embrace your cross because I know it is my pathway to get closer to you. I'm going to end tonight, friends, by reminding you of a vision that St. John the Apostle had at the end of his life. St. John, the youngest apostle who stood at the foot of the cross, he is the only apostle not to die as a martyr. He died of old age. And as an old, old man, he had a vision that was similar to that of Ezekiel's. Remember Ezekiel saw the temple restored with the Messiah and the water flowing out and the tree of life growing? St. John the Apostle, it is in the last book of the Bible, the last chapter, chapter 22, book of Revelation. And John says, I looked up into the sky and I saw the city of Jerusalem, the new city, the new people of God, beautifully restored by the Messiah at the end of time, shining brilliantly, surrounded by angels. And he says there was no temple building in the city because the temple is the Lamb of God himself. And John says, I saw something flowing out of the right side of that golden throne upon which the Lamb was seated something flowing out of that side of that temple. A life-giving stream of water was flowing. Water flowing. And as the water flowed, what was growing in the ground after the water passed over it? John says, trees of life. Not just one, many, many trees of life were now blossoming. That is, whenever you and I say yes to grace, the trees of life are blossoming everywhere. And then John heard a voice coming from the Lamb, from the throne, with the water of life flowing. And the voice says this to John, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To anyone who comes to me, I will give to drink from this spring of life-giving water. Every grace that you and I receive gushes forth from the fountain of all holiness, the sacred wounds of the crucified Christ. May you and I never look at a crucifix the same again when we realize that every grace Jesus wants to give you flows forth from those wounds in his precious blood flowing down through time and history to touch you at this very moment so that miracles of grace may abound in you.
Let us go forward this evening ready and expecting miracles of grace to blossom forth. Thank you. Let's have a good night's sleep, and we'll see you in the morning. God bless you. Fountain or the fountains in St. Peter's Square. All the way down to very little tiny fountains, you can find little cherub heads on the side of a wall spewing a single stream of water. But there are fountains everywhere in Rome, and they flow perpetually. The fountains in Rome flow 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and they are everywhere in the eternal city. Now, what most people do not realize is that there is not a single fountain in the city of Rome that is mechanically powered. The Romans, the ingenious Romans, many, many centuries ago, built aqueducts that carried the vast reservoir of fresh water from the mountains down into the city of Rome. And these aqueducts were constructed in such a way that the force of gravity alone brings the water down into the city and gushes into these fountains perpetually. While I was doing my studies in Rome and looking at these fountains, it occurred to me that the rushing of water into the city of Rome through these fountains is a symbol of every grace that you and I receive. For just as the source of fresh water for the eternal city is the mountain, so every grace you and I receive, the source of this grace, remains the inner life of the Trinity, the mountain where God alone dwells. And just as the pure water rushes down from the mountain into the city of Rome, so every grace you and I receive comes, flows down to us from the temple of heaven in the Incarnation. And just as the water gushes forth in the fountain, so every grace that you and I receive gushes forth from the sacred wounds of the crucified Christ. Jesus is the fountain of all holiness, and yet the Lord was asking something of me. Would I say yes to the cross that morning? Would I say yes to the outpouring of grace flowing from the crucified Christ? Well, stay tuned and I will let you know. I'd like to take you now to a city that your bishop knows well and our ambassador Nicholson knows very well also. That is the city of Rome. If you have ever been to Rome or seen images of it, you know that one of its most spectacular characteristics are the many fountains of Rome. There are many, many beautiful fountains in Rome, ranging from all different sizes. There is a very large uh, fountain in the Piazza Novona, a 30-foot high statue of Neptune in a very large fountain. Most tourists are familiar with the famous Trevi Fountain. Good evening, and I would like to thank your bishop and all of you for welcoming me to your beautiful country and your beautiful city. I was once in charge of a college seminary. I was the principal superior and disciplinarian for 55 men ages 18 to 22. Do you know what it is like to live with 55 young men, ages 18 to 22? Well, I never got to bed before 1 a.m. Pizza night for 55 men was 55 pizzas. Now, one winter morning, I can remember very clearly, it had frozen during the night, the, the ground was very icy, and a seminarian was on his way to class as I was. We were passing each other on the campus. He was going one way, I was going another. 
I said good morning, he passed by me. Now, it was very slippery out, and this seminarian was not taking too much care as to where he was going. Now, I was very busy that day. I had much to do that would keep me busy all day into the night. And yet the Lord was going to ask something very special of me that day. He was going to ask me to say yes to the cross. As the seminarian passed by me, I was on my way to class, I heard a terrible noise. And this was the noise of someone slipping. Whoops! I heard a crash. I turned over and saw this seminarian. He had slipped on the ice. Really his own fault. He was going much too fast on this ice. I looked down at him and I saw that his foot was in the exact opposite direction where it should be on a human leg. He had completely twisted his ankle around and he was in agony. Now, it was my responsibility to see that he was cared for. Now, I had much to do that day. 